I want to do this video to show you guys a little bit more about me in depth and kind of get familiar with my background and how I kind of got started in this business, how everything kind of came to be and obviously how I came to be business partners with Anthony and um, just kind of, you know, just some more about my, my significance in the whole role of everything. I'm 32 years old. I was born in Miami, Florida. Then I was brought to Dallas when I was... Um, about three or four years old, and then I was raised in Dallas pretty much my whole life from there on. I spent one semester in college, and it was not for me. I tried to become a musician, so, you know, in college I went to school for guitar, which I was a good, like, I was an avid guitar player when I was a lot younger. And I, you know, I bought all the amps, I bought all the guitars, I, I joined all kinds of weird bands and tried to, like, find my foot in the music world, but. Uh, ended up not going that direction, you know, but I still do play music, but it's obviously not my focus as a career, but it's definitely a passion at this point. I would say my passion for watches started very early on when I was probably 12. I right around um, when I was 13, my mom would take me to the malls all the time and I would actually First thing I would do is I'd go run to the local AD and go look at the showcases. Because back then, there was watches in them. There were some Mariners, Daytonas, GMTs, Datejust, President. There was everything you could imagine. You know, So it was never an issue of not being able to see something. So I'd really acquired a heavy taste towards Rolex when I was like 12 or 13 years old. So back, this is, this is kind of how I knew one day I would be a watch dealer because back in my junior high days, I was 12 or 13 years old and my mom took me to this area. Uh, it's like Chinatown. So they sold, I mean, literally they sold watches by the bags there. Uh, so you could walk in and they would have tables and tables of these, you know, fake iced out looking, well, they're not fake, but they're iced out looking Rolexes. They didn't say Rolex. They always said something like Geneve or something. Uh, and I bought like three or four of them as kind of like, they were cheap. They were like 60 bucks. And I took one to school one day. I sized it, took it to school and, uh, somebody noticed it on my wrist. They thought obviously, you know, being 13, uh, somebody thought it was a Rolex and I didn't really understand Rolex back then. So I was like, you know, so I was like, yeah, whatever, you know, it's this and that. And of course, the first question is how much, how much, how much? And I was like, uh, I'd sell it for like 350 and they're like, really? That's it? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll sell it for 350 So they bought it and then I ended up like, they ended up telling their friends where they got it from and then I had two or three more and I ended up selling all those. And it actually got me in trouble at school. They threatened to expel me if I kept it up because I guess they weren't about capitalism in school, so. So before I was a watch dealer, I was primarily working in valet. I did a lot of valet jobs throughout. And I did, before that I was doing uh, car sales. I would buy and sell cars. I've worked for car dealerships. So a lot of buy and sell um, jobs, mostly around cars and other other aspects like guitars. I bought I tried to buy and sell anything and everything when I was like, you know, between 18 and 23. My favorite thing I ever bought and sold was something I tried to keep for myself, but I actually had to sacrifice it for the greater good of my business was it was a uh, 1991 MR2 that I had custom built and it was pushing like 600 wheel horsepower so it was just a race car so you know but back then you know I was a gearhead and I was more focused on cars and I decided you know I had to take a leap and sell the car and start my watch business so that's when things kind of took off you know and got more serious and I got seriously involved with the watch community right after I sold that car which is probably the best thing ever because either one that car would have killed me or or two I would have ended up just keeping a car and working a basic job for the rest of my life. I got my first Rolex when I was 
uh, I want to say I was like 20 or 21, and um, it was actually savings from valeting. I, I went on my lunch break during a, a shift, and I bought a simple Datejust back then. It was probably 1100 bucks, and I think I flipped it for like $1,700. I made my first $600, and I thought it was absolutely amazing because you got to keep in mind, when you're a valet, it would take, you know, five to seven days to make that kind of money, and I made it in one hour. It was at a pawn shop, just, you know, uh, just a local pawn shop down the street from where I was valeting. I went on my lunch break. I was like, you know, that's when I started thinking about it. You know, like I started thinking, where can I find watches? And pawn shops was, you know, the biggest place to find watches back then. This is well before, you know, Chrono 24 was, you know, big and eBay was big with watches. You had to really hunt for watches. You had to really dive deep if you wanted to find watches for sale, especially from private party. I sold my first watch to a retail, actually. I didn't have a wholesale outlet back then. Uh, so I actually listed the watch on Craigslist. I, I bought a little light box, shot it really nice, cleaned it up, and threw it up on Craigslist for like two grand, and the guy negotiated me down to $1,700. And uh, the first watch I bought was a Rolex Datejust two-tone rose gold Buckley dial, which was a non-quick, which was you know, to this day, I've never seen another one. If I ever see one, I don't care what price it is, I'll buy it. So when I first started flipping watches back in 2012, when I did my first deal, it wasn't until 2014 I took the leap and I quit my job full time at the valet. And I'll tell you why I quit. It was kind of a crazy story. What happened was I ended up calling in a lot of sick days to go travel to Austin, to Houston, to San Antonio to pick up deals off of Craigslist. And back then I had a mentor that was kind of helping me out and showing me how to buy and sell watches. So back, so I had a lot of confidence in myself. So I just said, screw it, you know what? I'm, I mean, I'm getting in trouble anyways at work because I'm taking time off to go do a business that's actually making me more money you know, in a way shorter span of time than it is to just sit there and park cars all day for the airport. So I decided, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's, I'm going to quit and I'm going to focus on this full time. So from 2014, um, I was a full time watch dealer. I mean, it was, it was a struggle in the beginning. I had a lot of setbacks, but I definitely powered through it. To put it in perspective, the first sport model I ever bought was a ceramic Rolex Submariner and I paid $5,000 complete for it. So, I mean, that was the going rate for ceramic subs back in 2014, 15. You could buy a black for five to 55 and a green was like six to 6,500. You know, and GMTs were 45 to 5,000. I would say the early on challenges of uh, becoming a watch dealer full time was not having all the connections uh, that I needed back then to really like start my network. So my biggest thing was every time I'd have a watch, I was pretty much relying on the first two or first three wholesalers that I met. So I would just basically flip everything to them and I'm sure they were retelling the stuff out far more than I was selling it to them for. And I learned a lot of lessons that way because I, you know, I, like anybody else, would buy and sell something and realize I sold it far too cheap because I didn't have the knowledge of knowing what it was. And an example of that, uh, if you understand the vintage market, I bought a gilt dial GMT, uh, so it was a 66, and obviously nobody told me it was a gilt dial. So when I sold it for $6,500 and, you know, realized later on that was a $13,000 watch, it stung. And it definitely drove me to read more and study more about my products. And I definitely, you know, buckled down on knowledge. Facebook groups started roughly, you started noticing Facebook groups back in 16, 17. You said they started popping up. Um, I actually, so I have to give a huge credit to the motor groups. The motor groups is definitely where I saw a huge increase from my local sales all of a sudden became national and all of a sudden my wholesale outlets all of a sudden became national. So like all of a sudden I was connecting with people in Miami, people in LA, people in New York, all of a sudden like they were buying and bugging me every day. And then I was just, everything I touched, I was selling so fast. So my, you know, it was probably the best thing to happen to me early on was joining those Facebook groups. Um, and nowadays, you know, they're still, you know, they're still um, significant you know, especially to guys who are just starting. 
The first and biggest setback I had as a watch dealer was probably one that hit home the worst. And I was, I was robbed and I wasn't just robbed by anybody. I was robbed by my best friend. Uh, this is somebody I grew up with, you know, when I was 13 years old, we were, I mean, I would consider my best friend since we were 13 and he started developing mental problems around when I was 26 and already pretty engaged. Like my first year out as a full-time watch dealer, you know, this is, you know, I just, now started having a little inventory and having a little bit of money to play with and i left him at my house one day to take my at the time girlfriend to lunch and you know i come home and my safe's gone and my computer's gone and all these other things are gone and i was just like and he was gone so immediately i thought you know he, he jumped off the deep end and took my stuff or he's pranking me i, I couldn't tell which one because i was so confused well, I tried to call him, get a hold of him, couldn't get him all day. So I just realized, okay, yeah, he robbed me. He, he stole all my stuff and I was freaking out. I mean, I had everything I ever worked for in the safe and it was gone. And from that point, so when he took everything, I was left with nothing. I had to start over from, from the ground all the way up. So I, I did not end up getting another job. That was the one thing I told myself I wouldn't do. I wouldn't succumb to it. I wouldn't you know, let this destroy everything I work for. I mean, there was some stroke of luck to everything. Um, one, I was doing my laundry a week later, I found $500. And that was a little bit of a hoorah to that moment. And then there was the second thing was I had a Rolex Submariner and a date just being polished by a watchmaker. So, you know, luckily that didn't, you know, that, that didn't uh, get taken. So that was kind of like a start over to my foundation. So I, you know, had to, I went from having 30 grand in watches with cash back down to like five, but I made sure I, you know, it actually lit a fire in me and to just work harder and harder and harder. You know, I think it actually inspired me to just really, really, really work, you know, work for what I wanted and don't let this, you know, don't let this situation own you. So that was a big attribution to all, you know, where I am today, I would say. Thank you.